And welcome once again, my good friends, to another episode of the Red Delta Project podcast and live stream Q&A here on the RDP YouTube channel, where we simplify fitness by taking a fundamental approach to diet and exercise to give you more power, control, and freedom over your healthy lifestyle. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly, founder of the Red Delta Project and author of the books that sponsor these episodes like Grind Style Calisthenics, Micro Workouts, and Overcoming Isometrics. Links to all those to help support the show in both Kindle, PDF, and uh, hardcover, or not hardcover, but the soft cover or full physical formats is down below in the description for the total RDP library. So today's episode, we're getting back to basics. These are some things that I like to revisit especially sometimes at the start of the year. A lot of times we're kind of getting back into the groove after the holidays and after we've maybe missed a step or two with our workouts. It's time to get back down to the fundamentals of what works, what doesn't, and how to help you accomplish your goals. And today's primary topic is one that's very common, of course, which is how to build muscle and strength with calisthenics. What is working, what doesn't work, and what do the experts oftentimes get wrong with this sorts of thing? Now, the reason why I bring this up often, and it's something I've addressed in the past, is because these are the things we always want to be returning to. As a martial artist for years, every time you go into class, inevitably the instructor would be saying, okay, here are the basics, here are the things that we want to keep in mind, and he would repeat this stuff over and over and over again, not because he thinks we're forgetting it, but we always want to keep this stuff first and foremost in the center of our attention. But if we get distracted too much in a lot of the noise and a lot of the superficial details that often can cloud out the most important things that we need to understand, then we it's easy to lose our way. So these episodes that I do are more about getting grounded getting honest about what we need to focus on with every set, rep, and workout that you're doing. Okay? Very good. All right, so we set the stage there. So first and foremost, the thing that we always want to keep in mind when it comes to building muscle and strength with body weight training is that fundamentally, we're not doing anything different at all from any other type of strength training. Okay, It's no different than building muscle and strength with free weights, machines, bands, kettlebells, bow flex, isometrics, or what have you. When it comes to conditioning the body, on the fundamental level, there are no methods. It's kind of like in you know the Ant-Man, the Marvel Universe, at the quantum level, carbon is carbon and sodium is sodium and stuff on the molecular level, whether or not it's in table salt or something else, it's still the same molecule. And that's the same thing that we want to do when we take a fundamental approach to fitness is understanding that the results that we seek aren't about the method you're using. It's not about whether it's body weight training or calisthenics or whether or not you're using a particular brand of free weight or anything. That stuff is more of the superficial details that I wouldn't say isn't important. It is for reasons I'll get into a little bit long uh, later, but it's not the stuff that's ultimately in charge of what makes it work for you, why you get the results that you want and what we want to do is recognize that it's the fundamental natural processes of mother nature and human nature that are truly responsible for you being successful. We're just using different methods as a particular vehicle to influence that process. Okay? Here's a, a good questions here. This is the new format also I wanted to address because now I'm answering the questions from the RDP community as I'm talking here. So T-Bowl, good to have you on, my friend, asking a question. The original Grindstyle Calisthenics book, has it been updated? A couple of times, yes. The uh, last year, I've actually gone through the entire RDP library and updated everything. Now, it's kind of like college textbooks where they're like, great, you need to now buy this new book that's $300 because there's a new edition and all they did was they changed the font in the tables or something. So there have been some updates to the GSC book, uh, but it's not a huge thing. A lot of it's just formatting issues and stuff like that. But a couple of the big changes that did happen, uh, I don't think quite last year, but maybe shortly before the year before that, was a little bit more on the formatting in the program of the difference between the strength and the hypertrophy phase of things. And uh, basically the biggest one there, because the original GSC book that I came out with, uh, I was recommending kind of working a little bit more in the hypertrophy 
I, in quotes, zone of like eight to 12 reps for both strength and for the finisher phase. And one of the biggest changes I've made uh, in the additions uh, after that is saying, no, with strength phase, you want to be really heavy, get those reps really low, like usually around five, three to five repetitions, maybe six or so. And then for the finisher phase, you want high repetition, really, really high. Well, not really high. I'm not saying like hundreds of reps, but something like 10, 12, 15, 20 repetitions. So we get a very different stimuli from that. And this goes in with how do we build muscle with calisthenics? The same way we build it with anything else, which is we challenge the work capacity of the muscles. That's first and foremost, what we want to do in our workouts. But when it comes to work capacity, you've got the two variables, right? You've got how much tension is in the muscle and how much time can the muscle work for. And of course, those two things are inversely proportional. You got a lot of tension. You can't go for a long period of time. Hence the strength phase where you have lots of heavy resistance, but the reps are low. And then you change gears over into the hypertrophy phase in quotes again, uh, which is much more moderate weight or resistance, and you're doing much more higher repetitions. Now, there's a lot of argument back and forth. Everybody's debating over which is better for building muscle. And if anything can be taken away from uh, the debates and the research and stuff over collectively the past 20 years, it's that we can build uh, muscle with a wide range of stimuli. It's not like this is the one best way to train. We want to challenge our muscular work capacity in many different ways. So by using the multiple phase format of GSC, we're making sure to cover more bases than if you had just one set method of eight to 12 reps or do three sets of 10 or whatever, because we want to create a very strong stimulus for both strength and for endurance. And oftentimes when we go in the middle ground, we're creating a good stimuli, but we may feel that we can create a bigger, uh, stronger one by doing both. And that's what GSC is largely focused on and about. Holy smokes, people coming in long and strong. How's it going, everybody? Thank you very much for showing on up. <clears throat> uh, Jason A, how's it going? Thanks for all the info. Very good. Camille asking a good question on this one. Hello. Is the process of building muscle slower with calisthenics than with free weights? Very good question. And I would say probably not that much dependent on the method itself. There's a lot of influences from one person to the next that will determine the rate at which you can build muscle. And to be perfectly honest, most of those have nothing to do with your workouts. Okay, Because when we are working out, the workout is extremely important, yes, but it's actually a relatively small influence to your overall potential to build muscle and the rate at which you can build muscle. Because all you got to do with your workouts is progressively challenge your work capacity. How hard can you make your muscles work? But beyond that, that's it. That's all you can expect from your workout. If you get that from your workout, you're good. You're done. The workout is as good as it can possibly be. What ultimately is more responsible for your potential is can you adapt adequately to that stimuli that you are creating in your workouts? And that very much can determine the rate at which you build determine, uh, depending on uh, lifestyle factors like sleep, good diet. You know, you're not over restricting your diet or anything. You're eating plenty of good natural foods, stress management, but let's not kid ourselves here. Like we can do a lot to move the needle with our workouts and our diet and everything like that. But to be perfectly honest, a lot of the potential of how much muscle you build and how fast you build it comes down very much to influences that are not very much in our control. I'm speaking largely genetics, things like age, things like other influences, particularly even emotional influences in your life. Like if someone's going into the gym and they're like, okay, well, I, you know, it'd be kind of nice if I built some muscle and I kind of want to look good for the ladies in high school and stuff or guys or whatever. And they're saying, okay, this would be kind of nice. All right, this would be good. Then the effort they put into the workout and how serious they're going to take their recovery and their sleep and everything like that's going to be pretty good. And their rate of building up is going to be at a certain set. But you take someone who emotionally, they come into the gym and they're at this like mental and emotional place of, I have got to make this happen. And this is a very important thing. And I will die on this bench press, or you'll have to peel my cold, dead hands off this pull-up bar. 
before I give up on this thing. They're going into this with a life and death kind of seriousness to it. And they're taking that same level of seriousness to their diet and their recovery and everything like that. They're going to have a much greater chance to build muscle at a much faster rate of speed. So a lot of it depends on things that have nothing to do with the workout, but other influences on how quickly you can adapt to said stimuli. That's a very good question. Let's get into some more here. Michael Stokes, I recently bought a 10 kilogram weighted vest. Sorry, I'm an American. I don't understand this kilogram stuff. What is that? A thousand pounds or something? I kid, of course. I know it's roughly 22 pounds or so, but still, we Americans, we're, we're pretty ignorant in such ways. Which you've been using for pull-ups and dips. Will lower reps with the vest give different results to higher reps without it? So yes, it will be different, but not necessarily in the ways that we may be talking about here. So again, we want to challenge your muscular work capacity and we want both. Okay. So use the vest and without the vest. That's why in GSC, we have it set up in such a way that you're going to go, for example, in this case with the vest, lower repetitions. Okay. And when this we're doing our strength phase of our training, I find it's much more effective and safer and just more comfortable if we go with as much effort as you possibly can put into every repetition, but you're not quite draining the muscle and going to failure on this one. Leave a rep or two in the tank. It's a lot easier to push hard when it comes to intensity and save a couple reps in the tank. But on the hypertrophy or the finisher phase of GSC, then you would take the vest off and just destroy the muscle. Just go all out, grind out those reps, downshift into half reps. You're done with the pushups. Good. Get down on the floor, drop set, doing pushups kind of thing from dips to pushups. Then maybe even incline push. Use whatever you've got left. So the answer is we want both. It's not one or the other. And the more we get into which one is better for us, we're probably going to be missing the mark. And more to come on that in just a second, because usually when it comes to the debates on what we need to do in our workouts or diet and stuff, it's like, should I do it X way or Y way? Chances are you're going to be wrong with both. And instead, we want something that's kind of in between. So Eduardo Balotto, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. My apologies if not. Hello there. How do you combine cardio activity with calisthenics? Uh, what about rest? So there's two questions there. So one is rest, uh, rest periods in between sets in particular. So there's two ways to look at this. Uh, do you want to be more fresh for the next set or do you want to be more drained for the next set, depending on what you're going after? Now, again, with, with building muscle, we kind of want both because we want to both train our strength capacity, which requires more rest. So when you come to the set, you're ready to rock and roll and put a lot of effort into the set. But at the same time, we are trying to push the muscular workhouse capacity from an endurance standpoint. So here's the way we kind of want to do this. This is one of the new little additions into the GSC program that I've been making for uh, this month and so on, the Grind Style Calisthenics workout program that's free on my YouTube channel, which is when we are in our strength phase, we want to rest adequately in between sets to bring a lot of effort into each set because there are so many variables that determine how much you need to rest between sets. Again, when you pick a number, you're probably going to be wrong no matter what that number is. Should you rest a minute? Should you rest two minutes? Should you rest three minutes? What about 45 seconds? No matter what number you pick, you're gonna be wrong most of the time because there's a lot of variables that will determine, well, sometimes it should be longer, sometimes it should be less. If you're working muscles uh, or bigger muscles and bigger tension chains like your legs, that's gonna create more fatigue. You're gonna need more rest before you can hit it hard again. So you need more rest. But if you're doing something that doesn't require nearly as much fatigue, something like you know stretch outs on the uh, straps, which doesn't work nearly as much muscle, it's not nearly as metabolically demanding, you don't need nearly as much rest. So that's why I'm always telling people, rest as needed. Be your own guide for things. You basically wanna come to each set with as much moxie as possible into it. If you're coming to a strength set and you're really out of breath and you're just kind of out of it, like you're just not gonna bring much to the table. You're gonna squirm out a few repetitions, but you're not really gonna create much of a stimulus. You're making the exercise hard for the wrong reasons, okay? Just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's going to be effective. However, when we're going into our hypertrophy set, what we want with the finisher is to drain the hell out of the muscle. 
And so what you want to do with this is you do your final last set for your strength phase, for example, like you're doing pull-ups, you're like, okay, time to do rows to drain it out. Don't rest 20 minutes. <laughs> Don't rest, you know, five minutes and let yourself fully recover. Jump right into it. Just drive into it. Just go right for it because you're trying to create fatigue from more of that stamina set. So low rest in that regard. And then when it comes to general cardio kind of things, like I just want to get myself, my heart rate up, work up a sweat and stuff like that. I would say just do that for a different workout or a different part of the workout. That's that's separate for me. Like I'll do strength phase or strength training and stuff with calisthenics and stuff. And then a couple of days later, go out mountain biking or backcountry skiing or something like that. I don't mix the two together. Not that it's terribly detrimental, but there is there that sort of interference effect. And the more you focus time and energy in one direction, the less you have for something else. Edge, Edge, Ed, Ertem coming on. Hey, Matt, I've learned to use my scapular traction for rows and push-ups, but struggling for pull-ups. Very good. My pull-up form is great for a standard, quote, person, but not good for me as a student of uh, university. Yeah, yeah. So keep in mind that when we're doing our pull-ups, we want to maintain retraction. But here's the little tidbit that you often don't hear about, is it's not so much just retraction, but also thoracic extension of your spine. If you can get your extension of your upper back going, you're going to get more of that retraction. And often this is what screws people over with pull-ups is they get hunched over when they're doing pull-ups. And you can feel this for yourself. If you kind of hunch over kind of in a kyphotic quasimodo position and squeeze back, you're going to feel like your upper traps, but you don't get that much range. You extend your spine a little bit, boom. Oh, look, I got another inch or two that I can get and maintain that retraction. So when you get ready to hang or you are hanging from that bar, focus on lifting up your chest, extending your spine, and then you're probably going to get more of that retraction. But more on what I was talking about when we're trying to, quote, get an optimal number. The uh, how, how much should you rest? How many sets? How many repetitions? You know, how many exercises should you do? All these sorts of things. Lots of different uh, debate all over the place. We don't want to get too focused on the numbers. This is a preview to my next book that I'm writing and should come out towards the end of the month or maybe early February, where we get so focused on a singular number that we forget that the real power is being able to have flexibility and variability in the programming. So the analogy I always use, it's kind of like trying to figure out what's the optimal speed to drive your car at, okay? You, we can compile data of traffic and safety and road conditions and all these other sort of and fuel economy and a million other variables, pilot it all. But no matter what number you come across and end with, you're gonna be wrong most of the time. You should drive 25 miles an hour. No, you should drive 65 miles an hour. No, you should drive 45 miles an hour. No, it should be 40. And then for some reason, a lot of people like to get so precise, they're like 42 and a half miles an hour and so on, because it makes them sound more specific and uh, elite, like they're more of an expert, the more find a point they can put on it. But the bottom line is, no matter what number you come up with, you're wrong most of the time. And that's the big mistake that a lot of people make with calisthenics training, but also strength training in general, is they think this is the optimal number, and I stick to that one number, not paying attention to what the real objective of their training is, and then just choosing whatever sets, reps, rest periods, and other variables are best for their circumstances to accomplish that objective in their workout. So when you're driving your car, you don't look down and be like, I have to drive 45 miles an hour and I'm going to force that to happen. You say, well, it's snowing right now, traffic is heavy or traffic is light and this is the speed limit and a bunch of other variables. And then you choose your speed according to those variables and you change it accordingly. You don't follow the number, you change the number following whatever your circumstances are. And we want to do the same thing in our strength training. Get to a couple more questions here. Sneakiest, good to see you as always, my friend. Hey, Matt, whenever I do squats and deadlifts, I feel pain in the tailbone. My form is all right, but I do them without pain in that area. Uh, what can I do? So I would look at if you have a little bit too much, potentially, of a uh, um, an anterior pelvic tilt. You know, are you sticking your butt back just a bit too much? Uh, very common with squats, sometimes deadlifts as well. Uh, that's where I would look at. Tailbone, though, is interesting. It's not quite lower back. Um, I would also just uh, pay attention to range of motion. 
if you have a particular range of motion it's happening in, like in a deeper squat or deadlift and stuff, shorten the range of motion a little bit. You might have something that kind of got a little strained at a bigger range of motion, which is not too uncommon uh, with uh, big range of motion exercises, which squats and deadlifts can potentially be. And so let the muscle or the tissue or whatever heal up a little bit. And then once it heals, you can work on increasing that range of motion. So that's what I would do is make sure you have more of a neutral pelvis and shorten up the range of motion. See if that helps you right there. And once again, coming on, should I try to do pull-ups and improve my form? Or should I use rows to build my strength more and move to pull-ups? Well, it depends on how well you can do pull-ups, of course, um, but use both. Uh, use both and uh, feel which one can you, because you were mentioning that you can get that retraction on the rows. So use the pull, the like the rows as a good retraction warm up, all right? Or you may even want to do some retraction uh, scapular rows where you're just using your shoulder blades and not moving your arms, and then use that as a bit of warm up. Then try to carry that over to your pull ups and see if you can get that. It depends though. You know, a lot of times people are like, I can do X, you know, I could do this push up, I can do this pull ups and stuff. And a lot of times this happens with the body weight gym that I work at where people will say, Oh, I can do five pull ups. And I'll take a look at their form and everything. And like, No, we're not doing pull ups just yet. And I'll give them jackknife pull ups and rows and stuff. And we'll make it really fine tuned and dial in the technique. And then they'll get to the pull ups later. And they're like, Oh, man, I thought I knew what I was doing with pull ups. I didn't have any idea. And so as a result, a lot of us are jumping too far into an exercise that we're not quite stable enough for. And it kind of almost sounds a little bit like that with your shoulder blades. So what I would do is focus on the rows, do your pull-ups, play with your pull-ups with those retracted shoulder blades on the strong days, the days where you're really feeling good. Also, don't discredit uh, jackknife pull-ups where you're seated on the ground or your feet are up on a box or something. So cut down to a easier pull-up variation and that way you can get used to keeping your shoulder blades back with a vertical pulling style motion. And that way you can work on that technique a little bit more because we all have a level of resistance that if we go to that level, it's almost impossible to improve our technique. In which case we're not really building strength, we're building compensation. And that might be the case with your pull-ups. I'm not sure, I, I don't know it, uh, what you're looking like and stuff, but it could be the case where your rows are light enough that you can get the scaps controlled, but your pull-ups are still a little too heavy and you're just defaulting to whatever neuromuscular activation patterns you've got. So go with an easier set of pull-ups for now. And again, try the heavier pull-ups when you're really feeling uh, your best. Uh, good question here is total body tension aids in uh, building muscle. So yeah, so here's another thing that we want to keep in mind is as I always say, uh, integrate, don't isolate when it comes to our muscles. Uh, we want to integrate and have as many things working. Now, a lot of times people will jump into that thinking, okay, I've got to tense everything as tight as I possibly can, and they're doing push-ups and everything is locked up and stuff. That's not what that means at all. Uh, we want to engage everything else. So when we're doing our push-ups, glutes, quads, abs, hamstrings, and back, these are areas we still want to be engaged. We want to be using them with push-ups to provide more stability so the working muscles have something firm to push off of because you're only as strong as you are stable. And stability works not only in building strength but also muscle because the more unstable you are, in this case with pull-ups like with shoulder blade position and stuff, then what's gonna end up happening is in an unstable environment, your nervous system is attenuated, it's suppressed. You're not going to be able to contract your muscles as hard and you're not going to be able to contract them as much because the default recommendation for a uh, body that's in an unstable position is cut and run. You know, Terminate the set early. Uh, don't keep pushing yourself because your nervous system first and foremost has your health and safety in mind over your actual ability to push your muscles. That's why we always want to have kind of a total body activation to some degree to create as much stability in our body as possible. The more stable you are, the more you're gonna be able to push the muscles both in tension and stamina. It's kind of like taking off the brakes. So whenever we're doing exercises, just pay attention to the control of the rest of you. Like for example, pull-ups are a good one. 
you're doing pull-ups and your feet are kind of kicking around in their swaying and moving around stuff get those feet together lock them up keep a little bit of tension in your quads you don't need to have tension in your quads as if you're trying to leg press a thousand pounds but have some tension in to keep everything tight you know, tight is light, as they always say. And that's why you want to make sure you are stable as possible to give yourself the best chance of working your muscles as hard and as long as possible. Camille coming on again. You know, you're speaking of factors like genetics, age, muscle tension, capacity. Uh, what about going from an endurance sport, a pretty skinny guy, though a whole uh, carrier, for strength training? How can it affect? That's a very good question because that's exactly what I did. You know, I was a bike racer all through college and stuff. And then after college, I was like, I'm done with this. I'm well, I wasn't done with it. I still raced, but I want to focus on building some muscle. So, yeah, that's a big part of it. Uh, training history is another variable that really can influence your ability to build muscle and how quickly, because we all have a history. And the older we get, the more history we have. Of course, that's how time works. And we are always stronger and more willing to adapt to the circumstances and the stimuli our body is most used to. So like us endurance athletes, if you spent most of your youth racing bikes, cross-country running, cross-country skiing, things like that, running the mile and track and stuff, and at the age of 30, you're like, let's put on some muscle, mentally, physiologically, even emotionally, you're not really set up for that. <laughs> it's kind of like teaching the old dog new tricks in the proverbial way. And this is something I use a lot with coaches. Uh, as a coach, when I'm training someone, I'll be like, okay, so uh, what kind of sports did you play in school? And if they're like, yeah, I ran across country and you know, I played soccer. I'm like, okay, heavy, super uh, max out powerlifting style training probably isn't going to be as in your wheelhouse because you didn't grow up adapting to that type of stimuli. It's going to be way out of left field. You're not going to be as used to it. So what I would do is say, okay, we're going to put in a little more volume, a little bit on the lighter side, a little bit more high repetition stuff. So we're still going to strength training, but we're going more towards something that you're more used to in that capacity. But if you came to me and you're like, yeah, I ran 200, I played rugby and I was a lineman in football, like, okay, so challenging you to do uh, 100 push-ups is not going to be the way for you to go because you go hard and heavy and you burn out fast. So in that case, we're going to go in the opposite direction. And that's, of course, I'm speaking to extremes. Most of us aren't at those extremes. But if you notice that you tend to go towards cardio endurance stuff versus hardcore uh, strength stuff, then maybe edge your training in more uh, one way than the other because you're going to feel more positive feedback from that. You're going to feel a little bit more, uh, at least initially. Like for me, for the longest time, I did never, I never did any strength low rep stuff. I just could not make it work. I didn't have the stability. I didn't have the skill. I just couldn't get my body in line with it. But now I can, but I've been working at it for quite a while in order to make that sort of thing happen. So when we're talking about building muscle with calisthenics, it's tricky to be able to access some of those things for some people. So for example, we get caught in a calisthenics rut where you might say, okay, I've got pull-ups that I can do, but I can only do three repetitions. So that's very heavy, low rep stuff. So when I'm saying things like, okay, let's go with higher rep, let's get 15 reps. Do you do try to do forced pull-ups? No, you use an easier pulling exercise, rows, seated pull-ups, using a pull-up assistance machine, whatever that sort of thing. We want to stay focused on still the fundamental principle of what our muscles are doing, not what exercise you're doing. Like, I don't care if you're doing pull-ups or rows or jackknife or whatever. Think of how hard your muscles are working relative to time under tension. That's what you want to focus on. And then just change out your exercises accordingly. Don't worry too much of what exercise am I doing? What kind of exercise can I do? Because that's very prevalent in the calisthenics world where we will become focused on doing a particular type of exercise like standard push-ups and pull-ups. And they may not be the correct programming uh, exercise for what you're trying to do. It could be too heavy or too light. And then uh, you're just kind of running around in circles. 
<clears throat> Safe Center says, I hate that feeling of just waking up every day and never wanting to do my workouts. Yeah, that sucks, man. So in that case, I would say, well, why don't you want to do your workouts? So this goes down to, again, that emotional drive. Like we have to have a very strong, positive, emotional drive with what we're trying to do. Because without that drive, you're, you're dead. <laughs> you're done. You, you can kind of force yourself to some degree, uh, but it's a short-term thing. Uh, instead, we want to do something that we have a bit of an emotional affinity for. That's, again, why sometimes I'll ask people, what did you used to do in school? Because if you used to be super hardcore uh, power lifter, short, hard burst, intense, you're going to hate high rep stuff. If I'm like, all right, let's warm you up with you know a mile run on the treadmill, it's going to be hell on earth for you. There's no good reason for me to put you through that. Zero. You know, because if you don't like doing it, it's going to suck and you're not going to put as much effort into it as necessary. It's just the way it is. We want to come to the exercise with a bit of excitement. And this is where the fundamental approach to fitness is so important. You can change your workouts a million different ways. You know, chances are very good. If there's something about your workout you don't like, you can get rid of that thing. Very, very likely you don't have to do it that way and instead do it a certain way that um, you will like. Now, there's also the, the case to be made for recognizing, um, do you really want what you're after? So that the, we're getting more in the psychology of things. Do you really want to build muscle? Do you want, really want to have a more muscular physique? Or do you want athleticism? Do you really want to uh, be uh, exercising? Or do you want to be doing something more in a different realm of your health, like meditation or diet or something along those lines? Fundamentally, we humans are emotional creatures. And we have an affinity to feel good about things we get a positive feedback from. So if you are getting positive feedback from your exercise, and mentally, emotionally, and physically, it gives you something positive. You, your motivation to do it should be going up. Should, yeah, I, we all have days where it's like, oh, I don't feel like doing this today. I'm tired. I'm stressed. I don't want to do this sort of thing. In which case, I'd say, fine, don't do it. You know, change your workout or just put it off. It's perfectly fine. I do that all the time with clients. I'm like, I'm really not feeling so good. I'm like, do you think you could have a better workout tomorrow? Oh, yeah, definitely. Good night's sleep and a good dinner. I'll be better off tomorrow. I'm like, great, then let's do it tomorrow. Why force it? There's no good reason to force it today. So they're like, I'm being good, you know, and sticking to the plan and stuff. Screw that. You're playing these bat. You win the battle. You know, you, as Sun Tzu said, like if you don't fight a battle, you're probably going to lose. If you can say, well, if we attack tomorrow, we can probably win. Then you attack tomorrow. Same thing with your workouts. If I can put it off and do better later, you do better later. <laughs> the whole point is to do well, not to force yourself to work hard. And that's a big one that I find people get stuck with a lot, where they're like, the point of a workout is to work really hard and to make myself tired and stuff. No. That's not at all what a workout's about. That's not what it's supposed to be for. The workout is a chance to teach yourself how to perform at a higher level. You're upgrading your body, which is fantastic. It's not supposed to be doom and gloom and just, oh God, I got to force myself to do this thing. Not at all. Not at all, my friend. So yeah, I'm, and um, you know, it's, it's always about learning. And change whatever you want, however you want. Don't be afraid to experiment because all you need to do is find something that's going to work a little bit and then you can build off of it. But trying to force yourself to do things you don't want to do is almost always a recipe for disaster. Uh, it's very, very uh, uncommon for someone to actually stick with it. And even then, you're going to half-ass the workouts. You know, you're going to go through it with a fraction of the intensity that you want to be doing with... Um, that's going to get you where you want to go. So he's following up uh, lots of J-A-H. Yeah, lots of reps throughout the day. And bite size is incredibly helpful. Habit forming has its own unique advantages over full workouts. Yeah, so that's a good example there. Some people are going to feel good one way or the other. Does it really matter? No. You know, I don't care how you really do things, especially for those who are like having trouble yourself just getting the workouts in. It, at that point, I would say screw optimization. Hell, screw what even works. Right? If you're having trouble sticking to any type of workout program and motivation and good, same goes for diet and stuff, it's like, I don't care what you do. Just stick with it because then you've got something you can build up. 
I mean, this is uh, something in the writing format uh, that, that comes about as a writer. Like we're taught, you know, just write anything for your first draft. It's like, this isn't turning out very well. This is kind of a crappy report. This is a crappy, whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. Literally word vomit on the page, go on weird tangents, literally have three or four sentences where you're literally banging on the keyboard, you know, whatever, just get something on the page because the real success comes from editing. It's the exact same thing with diet and exercise. Just get yourself doing something, anything whatsoever. I don't care what it is. And then you improve upon that. And that's where the real success comes from, uh, especially when it comes to building some muscle. <clears throat> Brian, how you doing? Hey, Matt, how to engage the hamstrings when we squat? I have some problems on this. Very good question. So hamstring activation is very tricky uh, with the squat. And to a certain degree, some of the re research over on Stronger by Science suggests that squatting just isn't that much for the hamstrings to begin with. Like there's just not that much activation. Depends on the squat technique. And of course, my answer is always, well, then just engage them more. So here's the way to want to kind of think about it a little bit is when you're doing your squat, like you get your hips coming back a little bit and you want to uh, feel like it's not so much when you're coming down, but when you come up, drive the hips forward, which of course is something a lot of people have trouble with. Uh, lots and lots of people do not have any hip drive at all. And as a result, nothing's happening. So warm up before your squat with some sort of a hip extension exercise. Your heels up on uh, the couch or something and you're driving your hips up, hip bridges, kettlebell swings, uh, Romanian deadlifts, anything that's getting that hip drive where your glutes and hamstrings are engaging because that hip drive fundamentally carries over to the squat. It's exactly the same thing. So by engaging and turning them on before you squat, you're literally laying down the neural framework of, hey, these are how we use the hamstrings and the glutes. Then when you do the squat after that warm up, it should be like, oh, this is what we just did. And you're continuing with it. So that's what I would do for you is warm up with a hip activation exercise of your choice. Uh, so anything that makes you feel like it's working and hopefully that will carry on over. Mariano, good to see you, most uh, good sir. Hey Matt, what unilateral measurement method is recommended to correct imbalances in strength, for example, in the legs? Very good question. So a lot of this stuff just tends to pan itself out anyway. Uh, when you're doing unilateral exercises, and one of the benefits of unilateral exercise is it gives you a contrasting comparison of what's going on between your right and left side. And inevitably, it's always going to happen. Like, I don't care how balanced you are, you do, you know, single arm push-ups on a countertop on one side versus the other, you're going to feel a difference somewhere. And that's not a bad thing. The human body is not built to be ambidextrous. So when you're doing things on one side versus the other, savor it, pay attention to it. How does it feel different one side versus the other? Then it's up to you to say, okay, why is it different? Is it a technique thing? Is a shoulder hunching up? Do you have a little more rotation? If you are doing archer push-ups, is one elbow out more than the other? It's like the old uh, games you used to have in the newspaper back when you know they printed these things on a technology called Papper. Uh, with uh, ink, you know, you'd get it delivered to your house long before uh, computers and stuff like that. Ancient technology, I'm sure most of you don't remember it because I'm an old fuddy-duddy. But anyway, they'd always have these little games where they'd have a picture of stuff going on and they'd have a picture right next to it that looked almost identical, but you've got to find the differences. Like, oh, the, this guy's, uh, you know, he's got a sword that's a little bit longer and this little thing detail is missing in the other one. So it was always a game of contrast and compare. Can you spot the difference? Same exact thing with unilateral training on your right leg. Let's say you're doing lunges. It feels a certain way. Left leg, it feels differently. Why can you spot the difference? What's different? You're in the best shape, best position to identify what that difference is because you're the one getting the feedback from your body and videotape yourself. That can be very effective as well. So you can watch yourself. You can observe so much by watching. I did a video of course of, um, me doing some chest flies the, uh, during uh, the uh, RDP advent calendar and my shoulders were off. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. In fact, I was overcompensating because I always had more attraction on my left side than on my right. But due to my chiropractor and uh, therapy and everything that I've been doing, now I'm overcompensating. My right one is more attracted than my left. 
no clue whatsoever. It felt totally level, but then I saw the video. I was like, oh, wow, that is really different. So then I could start making changes. You just want to be able to identify the difference and then figure out how to minimize that over time. And that's part of the magic of, uh, of uh, unilateral training is it brings up those differences to a good degree. And when it comes to building muscle, again, it all ties in. Because the more balanced we are, the more stable we can be, the more stable you are, the easier it's going to be for you to push your muscles in both tension and endurance. Time and tension will be able to improve a lot more when you have more stability and unilateral balance and control that allow you to push a lot harder. Excuse me. <clears throat> Pardon. <clears throat> Swansea boy. Hey, Matt. Anything you can recommend for someone dealing with shoulder impingement to stop me from doing uh, push exercises. My pulls are going strong. Thank you very much. So first and foremost, if you have an injury, get it to heal. That's the bottom line. Uh, see doctors, see therapists, someone who can get you some hands-on approach to know exactly the extent of the injury because that's always a big thing. It's like sometimes an injury can be just a like, oh yeah, just give it a few weeks, you'll be fine. And other things can be so severe. It's like, well, you need surgery. And shoulders are like that too. They're so complicated in so many ways to go wrong with it. So of course, don't do anything that hurts. And uh, if you are still healing from it, yeah, uh, just lay off the, the pushing for a bit. It sucks, I know, but that may be your lot for a bit where you are having to just kind of hold back. If I were you, I would start to explore isometric stuff because especially with impingement, movement can be very problematic. So I would go with things that uh, focus primarily on like a downward direction. So get like an uh, ISO trainer around your back or just even pushing against a doorway or something, downward motion so you're not elevating your femur or your femur, your humerus against that shoulder and irritating that tendon. So you're just driving down and just working the chest. That's what I would look into is the isometrics for now or maybe even a very short range of motion. But downward motion is probably going to be your best bet for things that are not going to make it problematic. <clears throat> Let's see what else we can address here. But uh, yeah, like I said, don't get too hung up on the actual exercises uh, when it comes to like, what am I doing in my training? Because as long as you're progressing your muscular work capacity, that's as good as you're going to get. You've done the job. You've completed the mission. If you're like, well, I'm working my muscle harder over time, congratulations. <laughs> that's all you can do. You can't do any better than that. Uh, and then it's all down to more of the other lifestyle factors. Nelly asks, what's the king of all pull-up variations? Anything where you're pulling? To be honest with you, I think it does, it, variations don't really matter that much. Uh, it's really not that big a deal. And this is when we have better tension control in our muscles. The ultimate objective with fundamental movement patterns is it shouldn't be, uh, be very different from one side or the other. Because again, tension is not controlled by an exercise. Tension is controlled by your brain. So if you get really good at generating tension, your muscles should feel like they're roughly doing the same thing for any pulling movement. Like rows for me feel exactly like pull-ups. You know, overhand grip, underhand grip, neutral grip, wide grip, narrow grip. Like for the most part, these are all pretty much about the same. Because fundamentally, you're moving the same way. Elbow flexion and shoulder extension and so on. Little bit of a difference in like the flavors of the exercise, sure, but don't be going in the direction of people like, oh, it's do this for this type and this for that type and this variation for this type of. We want to smooth all that out. We want to smooth it all out so that the differences are as small as possible. Because when we create differences in the exercise, like you change your grip or you go from one angle to another and you're like, wow, that's totally different. What's ultimately happening is the exercise isn't doing anything different to you. What you're doing is you're using your muscles differently. And oftentimes it's to your detriment. You know, so let's say, for example, you do a pull-up variation. You're like, wow, I feel that in my arms. And then you do it a different variation. You're like, oh, I feel that in my back. You're not emphasizing your arms. You're not emphasizing your back. What you're doing with the arm emphasis one is you're turning off your back. You basically are screwing yourself over. You're like, well, I could be working my arms and my back, but let's not get too much benefit from this. Let's, let's cut it short. Let's cheat myself so I don't get as much out of this as I could. Then you're like, oh, I get this in my back, but it's not so much in my arms. 
yeah, you just basically said, I don't want to get as much benefit from this as I could. That's literally what's going on. You're not getting more benefit, you're getting less. But when you grab onto a pull-up bar and you're like, arms working, back working, shoulders in the traps working, every grip and stuff, now you're getting that benefit all the time, not just some of the time. You're no longer part-time activation, you're full-time activation. And if that doesn't help you build some muscle, I don't know what will when it comes to uh, that sort of, of uh, plus it's a lot easier on the joints as well. Excuse me, Matt, is it possible for a guy to develop tendon strength in the point where he's become you know, impossible to submit in a Brazilian jiu-jitsu role? So here's the thing about ten, uh, tendon strength, tendon ligament strength and stuff is a lot of people talk about it. And I think it's largely something that is just overblown because uh, ultimately tendons and ligaments, I mean, they're very, very strong structural tissues by design. And people oftentimes they'll say things like, I got to get my tendons stronger. That's kind of like taking steel and saying, you got to make that stronger somehow when you're making a, a knife or a sword or something. It's like, it's already strong and it's already many times stronger than it needs to be. Uh, you can, you know, augment the tissues to some degree because that's how the body adapts and everything, but no one ever has weak tendons and ligaments and stuff. Now, in the case of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I don't think that's ever the case because the whole point of a lot of those techniques in the martial arts is to put so much leverage against those tendons that there's no way in hell you're going to be able to resist that. You know, it, people literally have their tendons pop and tear and have injuries like that in Jiu Jitsu and Aikido and things like that because that's leverage. You know, Archimedes, you know, he says, give me a lever and a place to stand and I can move the world. And that's what leverage does is it allows you to apply a force against something that's so astronomically higher that there's no way it could possibly withstand it. And that's exactly the same thing with ligaments and tendons. On one side, yes, they are designed to be incredibly strong and incredibly resilient. You probably don't need to strengthen them. But on the other hand, those techniques in the martial arts are designed to make them pop like a sheet of bubble wrap, no matter how strong they are. So I don't think you can do that. Um, you know, instead you want to just be better at jujitsu, but if someone is able to get you in that position, it's tap or snap, my friend. Uh, I don't think you're going to be able to fight against that. Now you can make your muscles stronger. So that way the force they're applying to your arm or leg or whatever is going into the muscles, not so much the ligament and the tendon, but again, you're kind of limited there. And, uh, yeah, leverage is, is like that leverage is incredibly powerful. Uh, it's the math on it is ridiculous. Like every inch that you extend out from a leverage is exponentially more pounds of force against you know, the fulcrum or the moment arm and stuff. It's just ridiculous. Uh, and this is why a lot of times like people will say, I need to strengthen my lower back. I'm like, dude, if you're having like strains in your lower back, there's just nothing there to really strengthen for the most part. It's like there, you could have the lower back of Captain America. You still need it to be a thousand times stronger just to handle the forces you're putting into it because you're not using your glutes and your hamstrings and stabi stability enough. So uh, stress in those things, uh, you, the better way is get rid of the stress, not making the thing stronger than it is. And, uh, but I mean, I'm not a jujitsuist, but uh, in Taekwondo and stuff, we do have plenty of the wrist locks and things like that. And my Taekwondo instructor used to always, you know, make a show of like, here, look at this position. He's like my pinky. And he'd just apply force. And I'd be like, ah, geez, oh, God, oh, God, you know, tap out. And he's like my pinky. Imagine if he took his whole arm and just wrenched on it. There's no way I'd be able to build up my tissues to withstand that. Not at all. It's kind of like taking a power lifter and being like, are you strong enough to withstand this massive 40 ton boulder landing on your leg? And like, nope. <clears throat> So if center uh, counter uh, uh, concurring with this, I agree. Body has limits all in the mind. We can push ourselves past any perceived limits. But when we're starting off, we should not be, shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. Think more uh, gentleness, gentleness is the key. And that's definitely the case too, when it comes to uh, pushing our bodies. Like it's always a perception thing. And to a large degree, we all are in a, uh, an illusion of what we can do. You know, for those who are beginning, and starting out, like you're capable of so much more. I know a lot of people in, in the uh, the training spaces and Navy SEAL talk and stuff like this. It's like when you feel like you're quitting, you're only like something like 40% of your capacity or something like that. There's always a far more than we can do. 
But remember, you're never going to get in shape pushing yourself as hard as possible. That's not what stimulates change. If you, your goal, and this again is sometimes is a real motivation killer, like I don't want to work out. When your goal in your workout is to push yourself as hard as possible, I don't blame you. That sucks because pushing yourself as hard as possible is something that you can do very well uh, only once in a while. But when that's what you're telling yourself you need to do every single time, yeah, that sucks. There's no good about that. That's just going to drain your motivation. You don't get in shape by pushing yourself as hard as possible. You get in shape by performing to a higher level than before. And when it comes to building muscle with calisthenics, that's what we want to focus a lot on. Because it's not always about weight and reps. It's about, can you do this with a little more control, a little more range of motion? Are you keeping your arms in uh, when you do your dip? You know, Are you pausing at the bottom and then driving up? Or are you just bouncing out of it and wiggling around? Are you keeping control of your body in space when you're doing your pull-ups? Are you wobbling all over the place when you're doing lunges and stuff? These are still things of progressive uh, conditioning that we want to focus on. And so when we make it the goal to perform better than before in some way, shape or form, that's a hell of a lot easier on mind, body and lifestyle than I'm just going to push myself as hard as possible. Because the crux of it is you can push as hard as you can every time and never really tell your body to actually perform better. And as a result, you stay plateaued. It's like, I'm pushing as hard as I can. Yeah. And you're not going anywhere because you're not actually doing anything better. You don't get results by harder. You get results by better, which is still going to take good work, but uh, it's not uh, not a guarantee. <clears throat> nope, sorry here. I'm going different. A couple of things. A lot of conversations going on. I really appreciate you guys having each other's back. This is what we do here every Saturday here is we come together, we break bread, we drink our energy drinks and stuff. And we all help each other get stronger, even though I'm the one talking here and stuff like that. You guys are all here to help each other out. That's what the RDP community is all about. Tyler coming on and saying, Hey Matt, thanks for all the calisthenics advice. I just got back from under a barbell since COVID hit and my lifts still improve when, when, where they were with calisthenics. Absolutely. And this is what you want to kind of keep in mind. Why I'm always saying it's not really about the method. Because a lot of times, and this is what I mentioned in the video I just posted on uh, the RDP YouTube channel, is when people change methods, they uh, accidentally change their programming. And when their programming changes, that's what tells the body to be different. And they mistakenly think it's because of the, uh, the method they use. So it happens all the time with people go from weights to body weight or body weight to weights, and they change the programming so the amount of tension they're experiencing with their muscles either goes up or way down, or the time they're working goes up or down. And because of that, they're getting stronger or they're weaker or whatever. But ultimately, it has nothing to do with the method. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I changed from weights to calisthenics or calisthenics to weights, and I got this result. That means that's better or worse and stuff. It's like, no, it has nothing to do with that. When I went from uh, calisthenics full-time, I got a lot better results. And I made the mistake of thinking, oh, calisthenics are great. No, it had nothing to do with calisthenics. It's because I was finally training more intelligently. I wasn't just trying to beat my head against the wall. And I was like, maybe I should pay attention to form. <laughs> maybe I should pay attention to how well I'm engaging my muscles and creating total body stability rather than just how much weight I can move with a half rep or something like that. And so it's not about the method. It's about the programming and how well you can use the method that's most important. And if you can do it well and progress on the fundamental programming level, then yeah, the method, just do whatever the hell you want. It's not really all that uh, important one way or the other. Excuse me here and get a little dry throat. It is a cold, dark, rainy day here in Denver, my friends. And that's why I'm on the hoodie. I feel like I need a cup of hot tea here. <clears throat> Strong and conditioned. Good to see you again, sir. What's your thoughts? on the muscle building capabilities of Navy SEAL burpees of the content. So those who follow me for a while know that I've never been a fan of the burpee, but I don't know what a Navy SEAL burpee is particularly. But no, the reason for that is because it's a very, um, it's not a focused exercise. And this is something that kind of, I mean, it really doesn't matter what you do is you're working your muscle. Great. You're just going to build. So you can build muscle with burpees. You can build it with anything like that. Uh, it's not that bad, but 
you're probably going to have a hell of a lot easier time challenging the work capacity of the muscle with very, very simple, basic movement patterns that exert force against a muscle and keep the muscle working continuously. Okay, and this is one of the reasons I don't really do muscle ups, because if you were in the gym and you were like, okay, time to build some muscle and you had a pull down machine and a dip machine, and you're like one rep of pull over here, one rep of dip. Okay. And I change over one rep of a pull down and one red people would look at you like, what the hell are you doing? Sit on there, work your back. Good. Now go over here, work your push, you know, chain and stuff. Just get it done and fry out the muscles and things like the burpees, the muscle ups and stuff like that. It's kind of like saying, let's take an exercise that exercises a muscle in a particular direction but let's not work it again for a few seconds. Like let's work it and then rest it and then work it and then rest it. Cause that's fundamentally what you're doing with exercises that keep changing the direction of force that you're applying and your movement patterns and everything like that is you're turning things off and then on and then off and then on. So I always kind of think of this analogy of like flipping a burger on a grill, you know, here it is on the grill and we flip it way up and it's on and we flip it way up. And, it's, and like, how long is it gonna take to cook that thing? When we're trying to stimulate muscle synthesis, we wanna fry the mother living hell out of those muscles. That's kind of our objective. So you wanna take that burger, put it on the grill, keep it on the grill, put a brick on it and really just sear the mother living hell out of it. So that's why things like the burpees and the muscle ups and stuff, I've never been a big fan of because it's like, let's put it on the grill and take it off and put it on and take it off and put it on. And it's like, this can't take forever to cook it. Just leave it on the damn thing. Like leave it on, cook it and be done with it. And so that's why I've always been much more of a fan of just very, very basic movement patterns, push, pull, squat. Don't mix the things up. Can you still do it with the other? Yeah. You only need to work the muscle. It doesn't really matter how, it doesn't really matter what exercise you're doing, but you're probably going to have an easier time if it's a much simpler and more direct movement pattern rather than mixing things all on up and that way. And the other thing too, is again, we got to boil it down to, yeah, it's hard, but is it hard for the right reasons? I've never liked the burpee because it's really hard, but it doesn't do anything very well. Uh, that's one of the criticisms I have with it. If you came to me and you're like, I want to be powerful and explosive. I sure as hell wouldn't give you burpees. I'd give you jumping and plyometrics. I want to build muscle. Sure as hell wouldn't give you burpees. I got a hundred other things that are going to work better for that. You know, the burpee sells itself as this exercise that does a whole lot of stuff. It's like, yeah, but it doesn't do anything well other than just make you good at burpees and just jack your heart rate up. And I've kind of gotten a lot more critical about things that are like, yeah, it's hard, but is it hard for the right reason? And that's one of the biggest regrets that I have uh, over the years is I used to do things just because it was hard. Well, it's hard. It's got to be effective. A lot of times it's ineffective because it's hard. <laughs> it can be hard and actually take you in the wrong direction. You know, it's kind of like um, going with a uh, hard exercise. Like, this is so hard. I'm like, yeah. And it's completely detraining you. <laughs> and that's why I'm very much like I, for the most part, when it comes to most physical activity, I don't care at all. Like I want to work my muscles hard and I want to work them fast. Full stop. If it doesn't do that, I don't care. <laughs> I have absolutely zero interest in that training method because that's like saying, I want to cook a steak and you're like, great, here's a salad. I'm like that has nothing to do with what I want to do, but it's good for you. I don't care. You know, I have a very definitive focused approach. And when it comes to stimulating muscle, I think that's the best way to go. Very, very simple in that regard. All right. Hey Matt, uh, how much does a strong chest depend on a strong back? My chest progressions stopped. And I think it's because I've neglected my upper back. Yeah, very likely. So again, it all comes down to stability. You're only as strong as you are stable. Your nervous system's only going to allow you to push as long as you have stability. And a lot of times, especially in the calisthenics world, where we don't have benches and pads and external supports on the body, we need to use our muscles for that support. And it's usually the antagonist muscles of the ones we're trying to work. Now the back in particular plays a very strong supportive role in almost all calisthenics training. That's why everybody's like, oh, it's core training, core, core, core. Say, so screw the core back. If you have a good, strong back 
and you're able to stabilize those shoulder blades in particular, that's going to do a hell of a lot more for your stability and allow you to push uh, to a very large degree in upper, even lower body training. So the back is extremely important and it's the, uh, the key to uh, the chest, I really do believe, and shoulders down and back and uh, helping you to squeeze everything in, which in turn aids that adductive quality of your upper body. Big Zoe with a donation. Thank you very much, Zoe. Very much appreciated. Uh, yes, yes, Gary here with something I have to bring up. Gary Durant, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. You have to start somewhere, anywhere, just start exactly. One of the biggest things that kind of gets under my skin sometimes is when it's like, well, what's the best kind of thing for a beginner? What's the best exercise for a beginner for building muscle and stuff like that? And I say like, well, it's hard to say because there's no such thing as a standard beginner. You know, I've trained people who are like, I'm a beginner and they can bang out pushups like a Marine. And other people are like, I'm kind of advanced and they can't even get into a deep squat. So perception of where we are on the spectrum is way off. And that's why I always say, I don't care if beginner, expert, intermediate, doesn't matter. I never train anybody according to age, gender, or other things that the fitness, uh, the industrial fitness complex tries to tell you is so important. Like, oh, you should train this way if you're this gender or you're this old or you're a, you know, living in the Northern hemisphere or some other nonsense, right? It's all the divide and conquer marketing tactics. But I always train someone on your capabilities. That's what you want to base your training off of, right? If you struggle to do uh, push-ups against a countertop, well, then we start there. But if push-ups on the floor are easy, well, then we go above from there, right? You train according to your capabilities and we're all somewhere in that capability spectrum and you start with what you can do and then gradually ramp up from there. And that's what we wanna do regardless of the actual, uh, whether you're beginner or intermediate or uh, what's uh, so, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, Benny, Grin J, what are your thoughts on bilateral deficits? So a deficit of what is my question? Um, if you have a bilateral deficit, you probably don't have it bilateral. <laughs> so for example, if I'm doing push-ups and I notice one arm wings out a little bit, that's no longer bilateral. <laughs> you're now unilateral because you got a little bit more going on one side. So you're trying to be bilateral, but you're inadvertently being unilateral. So that's why sometimes bilateral can be very helpful with something that can give you some feedback, like uh, gymnastics rings. You know, a lot of times people do push-ups on gymnastics rings or push-ups on the floor. They're like, this is perfect. Yeah, I'm good. And then they get on the rings and they're like, whoa, what's my right arm doing? Like winging out way out to the side. It's very uh, telling <laughs> on what's going on with uh, things that are bilateral on a slightly unstable surface. Uh, Michael, co continuing the conversation, interesting how you aren't a fan of muscle ups. I was watching Athlean X channel about how he isn't a fan either, saying basically it's a party trip with no real benefit. I wouldn't go quite that far uh, because functionally, it's a very practical thing. Like I've been in situations like rock climbing and stuff where I've got to pull myself up onto a ledge and that's like a muscle up. So it's certainly got its applications. You know, if I was in a situation or in an app, in a uh, profession, I'm thinking like firefighter where I may have to reach up and pull something down or so, that's muscle up territory. So I wouldn't go so far as that. Again, it's, it's like everything else. It's a tool. And then it just boils down to, well, is it a tool that's applicable to your application and goals? And then making that decision. Whenever we get into a dogmatic approach of like, it's good, it's always good, it's the best, or it's terrible, it's horrible, never use it, we're, again, you're screwed either way. When you take a stand, you're immobile, and when you're immobile, you're always in the wrong place because we want to be fluid and flexible. It's like, it's great sometimes, and when it's good, I'm gonna use it. And when it's not so good and not in our best interest, I'm not going to use it. That gives you freedom. But especially these days in the, the climate we have, at least here in America, uh, you know, everybody's got their opinions and they're stuck. And that's why I'm always saying to people, like, I don't care if I'm right or wrong. I'm just worried about being stuck because it's like, I don't care what my opinion is on various topics and stuff. 
if I'm stuck, you're screwed. Full stop. Sometimes you could be right, but you're mostly going to be wrong. It's like going with that car analogy. I don't care how right you think you are that 45 miles an hour is how fast you should be driving your car. Most of the time on the roadways, that's the wrong speed. You know, we need the flexibility to ebb and flow. And that's why whenever you run across idiots like me who have these definitive opinions about things, it's like, it's always right. It's always wrong. It's always good. It's always bad and stuff. Be very wary of that kind of talk. Instead, we want to break out of that type of dogmatic approach. You're like, okay, that may be bad most of the time, but where's the exception to the rule? That's the exercise that I always like to give myself and people around me as well. It's like, yeah, okay, that's good, but where's the exception? No, there's no exception. Find one. There's always an exception. And if nothing else, it's a good mental activity too. Because if you don't know where those exceptions are, you're going to misapply it sooner or later. Sooner or later, it's just going to screw you over. And it doesn't matter how right you are when bad things are happening to you. Oh, here's a good one. Tyler, uh, my doctor says the best exercise is one you'll do consistently forever. Absolutely. And I'll say, kind of second that one a little bit because I've always, and maybe this is just the martial artist in me, but uh, Michael from Drop Weight Daddy, it, we've talked about this uh, a lot in the past where he, you know, being a martial artist himself, like we are always encouraged to have this long-term perspective with our training. And a lot of times the fads and the gimmicks and stuff that come up in fitness, they never entice me very much because my mind is always thinking, if I can't do this forever, what's the flipping point? You know, and sometimes there's, again, where's the ex example to that? Well, there was a time when I had a particular type of cycling program and I only needed to keep that program for about uh, three weeks because I was preparing for the Northeast uh, Collegiate Championship, of which I got third out of 80 people actually. And people are like, how long can you keep this up? I'm like, I only need to do this for another week. And after that, I don't have to do it ever again. And I haven't done it ever again. So sometimes when you have a definitive goal with a definitive finish line, yes, that's great. But for me in general, whenever I'm looking at diet and exercise habits, I'm always kind of looking at, well, if I can't always do it forever, then why even bother start? You know, I do the exercise I do and the dietary approaches because it's like I can easily do this for at least another five to 10 years. And that's what I think we should strive for for most of the time is don't think short term, 90 day challenge. Why? <laughs> What's the point? What are you going to do after 90 days? If you can't keep the habits, you can't keep the results. And if you can't keep it, then you better be okay with losing those results. Sometimes you are. It's like, I only need to be able to do this speed for this one day. And after that, I don't need to ride up this mountain again. Okay, great, fine. But if you're going after results, it's like, when are you okay with losing this? I don't ever want to lose that result. Well, then you'd better be using habits you can easily maintain for a very long period of time. And if you're finding that's not the case, we got to make some changes uh, right off uh, the bat. Oh, neck work. Yes. Mm. Thoughts on direct neck work uh, via wrestling bridges and stuff. I like that. You know, I like neck work. I don't do a lot of it myself. One of the benefits of calisthenics is our orientation to gravity is always changing. You know, we're on our back. We're kind of moving around. We're on our side, lateral chain training and stuff. So your neck is always getting work because you're holding your head up. So you're always getting some neck work to some degree. But yeah, I like, uh, you know, neck work and stuff like that. Isometric typically is usually the way I go. Uh, I'm not like moving the neck a whole lot. I know Jeff Cavalier has expressed a lot of uh, like nervousness about like, dude, you got some nerves and some small bones in there. You don't want to be like forcing the neck around. There's some stuff that can go wrong. Maybe so, maybe not. Who do I, who am I to say? But isometrically, you can get a lot of good net work in that. And I think that's a great way to go. Um, and uh, that way you can really uh, dial in the, the tension very high with that. Again, that's why I like isometrics. Some of the most direct high intensity muscle work you can possibly ever do. And so it's not about doing things with a lot of window dressing. It's how direct can we go? Hit the nail right on the head and get the job done quickly and walk away. All right. Are rows necessary? Anyway, just uh, any way to adjust pull-ups to get the best of both worlds? Nah, not necessarily totally necessary. I mean, they're both fundamentally the same movement pattern, um, but they are good to just mix in there uh, to some degree, drop sets, warm up sets, uh, that sort of thing. 
Um, it's one of those things that uh, you don't necessarily have to do it, but you're probably better off just keeping it in the repertoire. I wouldn't avoid them, you know, unless you had to uh, sort of thing. It's one of those things that uh, you probably have some degree of uh, intervention. Oh, good. Viren coming in again with the bilateral deficit. Bilateral deficit phenomenon, BLD, is defined as the inability of the neuromuscular system to generate maximal force when two Oh, uh, uh, harmonious limbs operate. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, 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 yes. So this is, uh, I, I'm glad you brought this up, but it was on the edge of my awareness for the longest time. And now I'm being reminded of it. So the idea is if you're like doing like say dumbbell bench press, right? You have two 50 pound dumbbells and you're like, yeah, this is maximum. But then you do one dumbbell and you're like, oh, suddenly I can lift 60 pounds. Hey, look at that sort of thing, kind of thing. And this just boils down to energy allocation within the body. Right. If you had because you're you're driving your muscles through neuromuscular activation, your brain is telling you to do things. And this is again, it's how direct are you working something? The more stuff you've got to spread your attention around, the less energy you can put in any one particular direction. So like case in point with the burpees and the muscle ups and stuff, it's like, yeah, well, I want to really get powerful and strong in my back and biceps. But when you mixing dips, in between every pull-up, it's not as direct to work. So when you're working unilaterally, you can put more energy into that one area and create it a little bit stronger. And that's just the way it's going to be. Like if you got to the point where you're 60 pound dumbbells and both, now it'll be seven on one side kind of thing. It's always going to be a little stronger with that unilateral action, just because you can put more energy and attention into a smaller, more focused and direct area of movement. That's a good thing. That's why, again, I like unilateral exercise for exactly that uh, reason. Excuse me, guys. Max D, good question here. New to calisthenics, what's your biggest tips? For right now, just work on keeping uh, your habits, getting consistent. That's the most important thing. Again, just get something down. Don't worry about the details. You're going to have a million people telling you what you should do and how you should do it and do it this way and do it that way. Screw them. Screw every single one of them, myself included, because nobody knows what's really best for you. Right now, the only thing you got to do is just get things to be fairly consistent. And I would say, make sure you're staying pretty balanced too. Um, just make sure you're not doing a thousand pushups and 10 rows, like keep the balance and how you're working your body fairly uh, consistent as well. That's a mistake a lot of people make as well. All right, a couple more before I jump on off here. Dave, good to see you, my friend. Thank you for coming on. Hey, Matt, have you played around with pulsing intensity and overcoming isometrics, like hard, uh, pull hard uh, as hard as possible for a sec, ease off, but still pull for a couple more than hard, exact, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, no, I haven't played with it very much uh, just because why would I pace myself? Um, so if, you know, it's like pull and then off and pull and then off. Some people do use that. They mentioned it in Overcoming Isometrics by Paul Wade. Um, and that's not so much about engaging muscle. It's about firing it off for some power. So pull, pull, pull. And it's just more of can you engage the muscle quickly? And that's a very powerful way to do that. But no, for the most part, I'm like, okay, hard as we can go, six seconds, and then need to take a break on after. And that's, again, usually more direct than that uh, what I'm going for. <laughs> a lot of people making comments, yes, you like my shiny head here. For one, I shaved last night, so that's another thing. The other thing is I have this light here uh, that's uh, doing my bald head beautiful justice here. It's very dark and blech out right now. Uh, I think it's kind of rainy and stuff, which is unusual here in Denver. We usually have a ton of sunshine. It's like being under a heat lamp 300 days a year. But yeah, that light, it's not exactly studio quality if you get my drift. Um, let's see. All right. Ex uh, excellent. Oh, one more thing. I got to bring this on here because Gary just put this up here. I got to, I'll close with this. Matt doesn't have uh, many opinions on other channels due to his focus. Absolutely. I get questions all the time. Hey, Matt, what do you think about this guy's program or that guy or this guy? I don't. <laughs> it's that simple. I stay kind of in my own lane, and it's not my job to dilute my attention to a million other things unless I'm looking for something specific. And I recommend the same thing for yourself. Stay more focused on you and what you're doing 
and to hell with what I'm doing, to hell with what I think and stuff. I'm just here to give you some ideas. I write my books to give you some ideas and to give you some help when and where I can. But ultimately, my friend, you're the captain of your own ship when it comes to this whole fitness thing. You're the one in charge. You should have your eyes forward and steering your course. And if you want a little help navigating, that's what I'm here for. And the books and stuff that I have down below, maybe it can help you. But in all honesty, us yahoos on podcasts and YouTube and other things like that, don't put us in charge. We don't know really what we're doing. We don't know what's best for you. You're the one who has the front row seats to the bridge of your own ship. So you're the one making the calls. And therefore, you should have more of your focus on what you're doing and what direction you're headed into. All right, I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you everybody so much for coming on. As always, great to see you all here once again. We do this each Saturday. Keep an eye on the RDP uh, Instagram channel for the announcements for the next episode coming out. And if you have questions, DM me on uh, Red Delta Project Instagram channel as well. And uh, thanks again, as always. I'll talk to you next week. Ball, Johnny, head, and all. Till then, be fit, live free.